time to you sit down and tell me what appears to be the problem? Okay, today we have a couple of questions that I collected uh, over the uh, past days. Uh, and I, I have tried to pick those questions that I think are relevant to a, a larger audience rather than just the one person who asked the question. And just to save some time, I have rephrased a few questions a little bit just to make the, uh, the wording you know, as, as concise as I could. Okay, let's not waste any time. The first question. The first question is from Vincent. Vincent says, I also love broad nibs. Just want to check with you that some of so-called 3B nibs, such as Pelican 3B or recently Omas 3B in their 90th edition, are they actually stub nibs? It has the downstroke uh, are much wider than the horizontal one. If yes, which is the broadest nib, not stub, you've ever used? Yeah, I understand what you mean. And I think the answer to the question is not all ultra broad nibs are stub nibs, but I do think that a lot of them tend to be stubby. And that's not really strange when you think about it. And nib has, I'm talking about tipped nibs here, right? So nibs with tipping material. There's a lot of tipping material on a double broad or triple broad nib. And um, I think that often uh, that is ground in such a way that you do get a slightly stubby uh, shape. So indeed you would get broad downstrokes and fine uh, side strokes, horizontal strokes. That's not always the case. And I have found that with some brands that is more the case than with others. For example, with Mont Blanc, I think both the broad and the double broad nibs, especially the double broad one, are definitely a bit stubby or italic-like. Um, whereas with other brands, I think with Pelican, I have experienced that less. I found those less stubby. Um, and there are brands where a broad nib is very round. For example, with a Faber Castell, uh, I don't think they do double broad, but they do do broad nibs, and those are completely round. So it really depends a bit, and I don't think there's any way of telling apart from really trying them out. So Mont Blanc is more stubby, and I think Pelican is less stubby. And those are also the, the, the really the, the brands that really offer it, or used to offer at least, the, uh, the, the very broad nibs. Okay, which is the broadest nib you have ever used uh, that is not a stub? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, I'm i inclined to say that the Visconti double broad nibs are definitely very broad, are maybe very slightly stub-like, but are not as stub-like as Mont Blanc nibs. So you could look into that. Um, but uh, to be honest, it's actually getting pretty difficult to find ultra-broad nibs. So I would say have a look at Visconti. Now Vincent had a second question. My second question, Pelican M1000's triple broad and M800's triple broad, are they provide same white lines? Uh, no. I do think that the, the, the M1000 nib is a little bit bigger, so a little bit longer than the M800 nib. Um, they are both, they used to offer, Pelican used to offer triple broads in both pens, and they just don't anymore. So this is a bit of an academic question. You really have to scoop up these nibs if you want them and you can find them somewhere. Um, I do believe that the M1000 nib is just ever so slightly broader than the M800 nib. Maybe just because it's bigger, there's just a little bit more tipping material. But to be honest, the difference is really marginal. It's not a, a huge difference. You're not even talking about a millimeter. So it's it's really, really small. I, I wouldn't you know, read too much into that. The next question is from Stephen. I like your name. Uh, Stephen asks, I also love broad nibs. No, wait a minute. Uh, we have already ha had that one. Um, I'm just going to go on. And the next question is from uh, Robert. Robert asked, and this is something I, I really uh, paraphrased a bit, um, which piston fillers have the most generous ink capacity? And for left-handed writers, is there a better medium or broad nib to use? Um, let's, let's first have a look at uh, piston fillers with large ink capacity. Well, a, a piston filler with a, a large ink capacity, um, to be honest, is, I think, fairly hard to find. If you want a, a really big ink capacity, uh, then I think you're, the, the best thing you can do is get a, um, a, a vacuum filler, something like Visconti Power Filler or 
another uh, vacuum filler like the, the Twisby VAC 700. The VAC Mini of course is a, a smaller pen but it also, if you fill it, com fill it completely, it also has a large ink capacity. Um, I, I think that is the best option but if you ask specifically for a piston filler, so not a vacuum system but an actual piston filler, um, I think a lot of pens offer roughly the same ink capacity. For example, I always thought that a Mont Blanc 149 had a, an enormous ink capacity because it's such a, a thick pen. But I measured it and I came up to about 1.2 milliliters. And if you realize that uh, the standard cartridge converter is what, 0.7 milliliters or something, then it's really not that much more. I mean, I understand that it's almost twice as much, but it's not suddenly going from 0.7 to 3 milliliters or something. Whereas uh, a larger Visconti, like the, the Opera Master, I know that I mention those pens a lot, but it's because I really like them, and there's a reason for that. One of the reasons is that they really have a large ink capacity. I think with that one I can go well over 3 milliliters if I fill it completely, so that is a really big ink capacity. But piston fillers I'm not yeah, I'm not too sure. So yes, Mont Blanc 149, uh, Pelican M1000, at least those are bigger pens, so they have a bigger barrel. But relatively speaking, I don't think they hold that much more ink than, um, you know, say, a Lamy 2000. The other question was, for left-handed users, is there a better medium or broad nib to use? I get a lot of questions from left-handed writers who, who ask me these kinds of things, and it's very hard for me to answer because I'm not a left-handed writer. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I, I know there is another question in the lineup here that deals with left-handedness, um, but I don't know. My idea would be to, to check out a slightly less wet medium or broad that makes sense because you don't wipe it out as you write from left to right. But apart from that, I, I really don't know. I, uh, I, I really ask my viewers to, to jump in here. I know there's a bunch of lefties out there who use fountain pens. Maybe you can comment on this because I, I really don't know. I, I, I just, because I'm not left-handed, it's, it's hard for me to relate. So as I said, um, wetness is uh, uh, something that I would, uh, I would consider, but apart from that I, I just uh, don't know. Okay, uh, the next question. I had this question that I mentioned earlier from uh, Stephen, but then I had miscopied it, so I have it here. Um, first, he has three questions. First question, you have lots and lots of pens, which two do you use most often and why? I don't have as many pens as a lot of people think, I think. Uh, I, I, for some reason I, I believe that people are under the impression that I own hundreds of pens, but I think I own about 40, if that. Um, which is not a, a small number, but it's it's also not the hundreds, or, or sometimes I, I read things like Asbury Brown must own thousands of pens. Well, that is definitely not the case. Bear in mind that anything I don't really like, I either give away or sell. So I have a very nuclear collection of pens that I own and use, and that's it. Uh, which two do I use most? Well, um... I'm going to make your life a little bit harder and I'm going to mention three. All right, I have three pens that I would consider my absolute favorites. Of course I have my, my goat pens videos where I go into a lot more detail, but my Visconti Opera Master I have a couple, but the tobacco finish I, I absolutely love. I think it's a gorgeous pen, I think it has a great nib uh, and it has a, a fantastic ink capacity, so it's all I want really. Second one is the Omas Paragon and the Arco Celluloid. Uh, that's a fantastic pen, has a great fine nib, super smooth, nice big ink capacity. By the way, that is another one. The the Paragons have a large ink capacity. So Rob, if you're looking for a big ink capacity pen with a piston, check out that one. Um, I love that. And the Arco Celluloid is, is gorgeous. You cannot look at that and think, nah, it doesn't do much for me, I think. The third one is um, I have a special edition uh, Visconti that was uh, launched for the 25th anniversary of the company. It's in black Arushi lacquer. It is slightly smaller than a Visconti Opera Master, but it looks a lot like it. Um, that pen is fantastic. It has a broad nib that is a joy to use. Very wet, but not a gusher, so that it's almost unusable and perfectly tuned. I absolutely love that pen. Second question is, how many bottles of ink do you have? What characteristics do you look for in everyday ink? Color, wetness, cost, etc. Um, I don't know how many bottles of ink I have. Again, not as many as you may think. Definitely not hundreds. Um, 
what, maybe 50, if that? I don't know. I'm just uh, coming up with, with a, a number here. I'm, I'm looking at my uh, cabinet that has drawers of ink in it. I think it's about 50. And what do I look for? Well, there's a couple of things I look for. It needs to flow well. I, I hate dry inks. I, I, I really I, I want a nice rich flow. That's why I use a fountain pen. Otherwise, I would use a ballpoint. So that's an important thing for me. I like color. Uh, I like colored inks, but I don't like nuclear inks. So uh, an ink has to have a color that I can use. If it's yellow, for example, Gerbin Bouton d'Or, gorgeous color a very bright yellow, but it's so light that when I write it down on white paper I can't read back what I wrote. That's useless to me. I need something that I can read and write, you know, I can read back and I can write with pleasantly. Uh, so I like colors that offer good contrast. Uh, blue, royal blue, made by pretty much every company, be it Waterman, uh, Montblanc, etc. I think is, is great. Is it a little boring? Yes, but you can read it very well. Not the most water resistant though, because it's washable. Um, I like browns, I like greens, so I like those kinds of colors that are nice and clear when you write them, write with them. Uh, cost, of course, yeah, that's also uh, a concern. Uh, some inks uh, are extremely expensive. Uh, think, for example, of something like Yoroshizuko inks. I don't use them that much, not because of the cost, but I, it's just not my brand. Um, some inks are very affordable, like Pelican. Those are a little bit dry, though. Uh, Waterman inks are, are quite nice, uh, so yeah, these are all things I think of. And the final thing I would say that's very important to me is safety. Uh, I want to use an ink that will not affect the pen negatively. And there definitely are uh, brands that I have personally experienced uh, that are not too kind on pens. Um, and I, uh, I will get back to that in uh, one of the later questions. Uh, the final question from Stephen was, with so many pens and inks at your disposal, what do you use them for? Note-taking, journal, letter-writing, sketching, surely they're put uh, to more use than merely reviewing. Oh yes, for sure. I, uh, I use them a lot, and definitely not, not just reviewing. Some pens I review, and then I think, yeah, it's just not for me, and then I, I sell it or give it away. Um, but, yeah, pens I use, I use them a lot at work. I, I take a lot of notes at work, of what I'm doing, of what I've read, etc. I Maybe in meetings or, or lectures sometimes. Uh, I, I use them for that. And I try to use them for as many things as I can. So you will really not find me using a ballpoint that much. Even for doing something silly like writing grocery lists or such, I, I do not use a ballpoint. I, I will use a fountain pen. And when once you do that, you find yourself using pens a lot and using them for pretty much everything. So I I would say that it is very uncommon for me to have a day pass without having written down something with a fountain pen. Okay, the next question I found very interesting. It was from Rob, and Rob asks, how should I orient an italic or stub nib to the paper? Some people hold it normally, and others hold it in a, hold it in a slanted fashion. Yes. Writing with an italic nib or a stub nib, but mainly an italic nib because they have very crisp edges, uh, that takes some practice. And I, um, I experimented a bit with it myself, just the other day I was doing that. Um, it remains a little enigmatic to me. Uh, you can... So an italic nib, for those of you who don't know, that's a, a nib with very sharp, crisp edges. So instead of the tipping being round, the tipping of the nib is squarish, and that leads to a very broad downstroke and a much narrower side stroke. Right? If you picture your hand as with a nib, you can see why. Now, the um, I didn't just give you a blessing or anything. That was just me uh, simulating a nib. Now, um, what I typically do is hold it in a slightly slanted fashion. I think that's just because of the way that's how I hold my pens. Uh, that also actually turns that nib more into an oblique, right? Which is a nib that is kind of ground like, like this or like that. Um, and I, for me, that's the most pleasant way to use it, but to optimize line variation, you should hold it as straight to the paper as you can, because then you get the ultra broad uh, downstrokes and the narrower side strokes. If you slant it a bit, then this stroke will become narrower and that stroke will become broader. So I think that the, the, the easiest way to answer that question, and I'm, I'll be the first to admit that's a slightly lame way to answer it, but is do whatever works for you. All right? Just You have to feel comfortable with it, you have to feel comfortable holding the pen, using it, 
and making it right any way you like. Um, if you slant an Italian nib too much, the tips will not really touch the paper well and they will start to skip. But then again, the same thing for a round nib. So you have to, it's just more pronounced, I guess, than an Italian nib. So you just have to practice a bit and, and play around with it. And I, I hope that adds something to your question. Um, because as I said, it's a bit of a, a non-answer. Okay, then there's Parsa, and Parsa asks, how do you fill a piston-filled pen without staining the celluloid? Yeah, that's a good question. I can come up with two ways. Um, one way deals with filling the pen. If you really want to make sure that the celluloid does not come into contact with the ink, use the feet saturation method. For that, you will need something like a syringe. You draw up the ink, and you slowly, very slowly, kind of inject it into the feed, and because of capillary action, usually that goes towards the tip of the nib, but if you wait, if you tilt it downwards with the nib pointing at the ceiling, ink will flow into the reservoir. For that, you, know, you don't just need a syringe, you also need an insane amount of patience, especially with a piston filler, because that takes a long time for the pen to fill up. I do not have that patience. Um, I'm a pretty patient man, but that, I mean, I, I you know, it doesn't work that way. Second thing you can do is that's what I do. Make sure you have a damp cloth at hand, not soaking wet, just damp. It could even be the kitchen tissue that you have wrung out and you know that you have ready. Ink up your pen, immediately wipe it down towards the nib, and that's fine. And then just dry it off, and you will have no issues with staining. At least I don't, and I've, I've used quite a couple of celluloid pens. I love celluloid, so maybe that that will help in making that easier. Okay, then there is David, and David asks, I have a Pilot E65, but the Con20 converter leaks a bit. Is this a common problem? And again, guys, sorry, I've paraphrased some of your questions to make them a bit shorter. Um, as far as I know, that is not necessarily a common problem with the Con20. Now, for those of you who don't know it, the Con20 converter is a, a metal frame with a rubber sack in it, or latex, whatever it is. I mean, some, some soft gushing, what we call that, mushy material, uh, with a bar. So you click it into the pen, and you press the bar, that compresses the sack on the inside, you let it go in the ink, and then it will expand, and it will draw up ink. I have not really experienced leakage with that, but I can come up with two things here. One problem, I mean, you don't say where it leaks, uh, it's possible that the sack has become porous. Sometimes that happens, it happens with vintage pens, but I guess it could also happen with modern pens. And then if there's a, just, you know, a pinhole hole in that sack, then ink could dribble out there. That's one possibility. Other possibility is that ink leaks from the point where the, um, the converter connects with the nipple on the back of the feed. Or most pilot pens have little plastic uh, things sticking out that you click the converter onto. What I have found with those converters is that you really have to push them on quite hard. So what I would suggest is make sure that when you push it in, you push it in all the way. Now, of course, you have to be careful. You don't want to break off anything. But if you don't put it on all the way, then you know even if there is half a millimeter of clay there, ink could get out. Right? It could start to leak and dribble down the barrel. So I would check that. And if that also doesn't work, yeah, then maybe the converter is faulty. Or there is a, maybe a, a, a crack down section. I don't know. You, that would require some uh, investigation. Okay. Then there was a question from Ninpo 1500, who had a uh, he indicated he had a long backstory, and and it was it was a very interesting backstory though. But what it boils down to is what is my routine for cleaning a new pen? Uh, he uh, unfortunately had to spend 30 hours cleaning his Pilot Metropolitan before it wrote well. Um, well, this is a, a question that I think is very interesting because this concerns a lot of people and I do get this question a lot. So, thanks for asking that. My routine is quite simple. I use small plastic Tupperware containers uh, and um, for cleaning pens. They hold about 60 milliliters of uh, liquid. And what I do with those is I create two of those when I start to clean a new pen. And I also do that occasionally when a pen has had a, uh, a very uh, saturated ink in it, for example. I take a container and then I... Um, uh, my lovely assistant is just handing them to me. Thank you. 
uh, these are the containers. They're extremely useful. The reason they're useful is they're so small, they come with little caps, so you can put other stuff in them, but they're perfect for a pen because you can dip it in, you don't need too much, you don't need to waste a lot of water. This is all you need. I use the colored one. What I do is I put in water, just water, not distilled water. I really don't bother with distilled water. You only need that if you really live in an area where they have extremely hard water that's so hard that as soon as you dip your pen in it melts. And then you have a problem. Okay, but if that's not the case, don't worry about it. I take something like this, and it could be anything. It could also be a shot glass. It, could be, it doesn't have to be this. All right, but I use this. I put in water, and I put in um, two or three drops of dishwashing detergent. All right, what you use for doing your dishes by hand. That's all. I just put in that. Now I take another one, and I put in water. Just regular, clean tap water. All right. Then I draw up. First, the, the soapy water with the detergent in it, somewhere between five and ten times. All right, that's not a holy amount. You can also do it twelve times. You can also do it six times. It doesn't matter. All right, but I just I do that. The reason I do that is that dishwashing detergent dissolves grease, and especially if you have a pen with a converter, for example. Sometimes they have a little bit of machine oil residue left in it, and then it's nice to just degrease it a bit, and that stuff works great. You don't put in dishwashing detergent in its pure form into your pen, right? That's not a good idea. You need it strongly diluted, that's what I do. And I do that, as I said, five to ten times, and then I, every time I, I get rid of that water, put in some more, get rid of that water, etc. After that, I just take my regular water, I draw up water there, until the water that's coming out of the pen no longer has any bubbles in it. Okay, there's no foam in it, because you're going to get foam in your converter or your piston or whatever, be full. It doesn't hurt, it's fine, you can just do that, and that's all there's to it. And then, usually, I ink them up straight away and they write fine. I mean, I'm not talking about nibs that need some tuning or anything, that's all I do to clean a pen. Uh, now, one thing I will say is dishwashing detergent, what can happen, I've had that happen, is that it does, as I said, dissolve grease. And sometimes when you have a piston filled pen, the, the manufacturer puts some grease on the inside of the barrel and sometimes that dissolves a bit, and especially when you have the uh, dishwashing detergent water in the pen, the piston can operate a little less smoothly. But in my experience, once you have flushed that out with regular water, um, that problem disappears and it becomes smooth again. Although sometimes I do need to add a little bit of silicon grease, but to be honest, it, it doesn't happen that much. It doesn't happen that often, I should say. So I wouldn't worry about that too much, but that is my, my personal uh, cleaning routine. And there was a question from Didi, and I found that a very interesting question. Are modern iron gold uh, inks safe to use in modern and vintage pens? Iron gold inks. Beautiful inks. Uh, I love them. I, I it's, uh, it's, It gives me a sense of history to use them. Uh, they have been used for quite a while throughout history. There's a reason we can still read medieval manuscripts and that is because typically they were written in iron gold inks. So if you need an ink that is bulletproof, that will not fade, that will not die when you put water on it, iron gold is my go-to ink. But iron gold inks are not really friendly. Uh, they are a bit harsh. Montblanc had an iron gold ink in their lineup, so bear in mind, if Montblanc has an iron gold ink in their lineup and they find it safe enough to use in their pens, and they're very pedantic about what you can and cannot put in their pens, I think it should be relatively safe. However, there are definitely stories of iron gold inks that have molten feeds of pens, have clogged pens, so that is a possibility. Now, what I do is I dedicate pens to iron gold inks. I have my Shrey Tactical Fountain Pen, um, and I have I always have iron gold ink in that, and I use that to address envelopes because it's beautiful. You can use a fountain pen to address your envelopes or parcels or whatever, and the ink will not run, even if it's, it stands in pouring rain for a long time, it will not run. But I dedicate the pen to that, and that means that that pen is for iron gold ink, and to be honest. I regularly clean it, because that is something you have to do, and I regularly inspect the feed, and so far, even though the ink has been in there for, well, over a year now, it's uh, a Schrade tactical pen, but it has a Monteverde nib and feed on it, which is just a plastic feed, I've had no problems with it, there's been no clogging, 
but again, regular cleaning. And there has been no melting of the feed or warping or anything like that. Uh, same thing for the nib. Um, I do think I see a little bit of wear on the nib that is that may be caused by the ink, uh, but it really stayed in pretty good shape. But here you need to exercise the same caution as you do with any inks. If you have one special pen that you absolutely love and that you want to keep in pristine condition, then iron gold is probably not your ink. And quite simply, you should probably not use it. Uh, if you have a pen that you absolutely love and that you don't want to be hurt, then use washable blue and use it exclusively. If you want to use an iron gold ink, I would say go ahead, just exercise extra proper pen hygiene, so clean extra well afterwards, maybe in the way I just uh, suggested, a little bit of dishwashing detergent and water, and I really think you should be okay, but you never know, so be careful. Now, the second uh, part of the question was about vintage pens. I would be a bit more careful there, especially vintage pens that have sacks, rubber sacks in them, um, those sags are known to deteriorate with uh, the wrong inks. Um, so I would be hesitant to put an iron gall ink in a vintage pen. And I'm sure there's people who do it, and I'm sure that people have no issues with it. But I personally would not. Okay, we have a question from Sean, and Sean asks. Can you recommend a pen with a music nib for under $100? I want to use it to draw music notes. Well, the one pen that comes to mind is, of course, the Noodlers and the Ponset, because that is a pen under $100 that has a music nib. What I will say about the Nippon set is this, though. I have used four. The original, I think it was acrylic one, uh, that was sent out as a prize. Uh, to a person who had won that for a noodles, I think it was an art competition or something. And then I have used uh, two of the ebonite versions. One of them was one belonged to a friend, one that I purchased myself, and then recently someone else sent me one. Only one of those four pens actually worked the way it should, and that was the original acrylic one. All the others have had issues, issues ranging from extreme railroading, um, not writing, just not writing, running dry immediately uh, after writing a sentence, uh, not flexing adequately, feed not keeping up with the ink flow. So that means that, in my case, 75% of the pens Nippon says that I've used were dysfunctional in some way or another. And to me that is a reason to not recommend that pen. Uh, and this is a clear case of your mileage may vary. I know there's a large noodles fan base. I know that people don't like it when I say these things. But this is my personal first-hand experience. 75% of the Nippon sets I've used had issues. And that's all there's to it. Now let me recommend you something else. I understand you want a music nib because you want to write music notes. But here's the secret. There are other nibs you can use to write music notes with and it doesn't need to be a music nib. Uh, the only thing a music nib does is because it has two slits, typically, not always, but typically, um, you can do a few things with it. It's also a more stub-like nib, so one thing a good music nib does is because it has two slits, it has very consistent ink flow, and a good music nib, you should be able to turn straight into the paper. So with a round nib, you can't do that, but with a music nib, which you usually write like this, you should be able to write like this, and get a very fine line because the nib is uh, italic in shape. Here's what I would recommend. Get a platinum desk pen. The platinum carbon desk pen is well under $100, uh, especially if you don't purchase the separate desk stand, but if you do, I think it's still under $100. It has a very fine nib, uh, but it has a feed with an extra white channel to accommodate the carbon ink that platinum does, uh, which is very black, so it's very good, very legible, very good for music notes, and it's a very fine nib. It's a Japanese, well, I don't even know if it's a Japanese fine or if it's a Japanese extra fine, but it's a very, very fine nib, which I think would be great for music notes, which tend to be a little thin. Also, that pen has an excellent flow. I, I really enjoy it, and for such a fine nib, it's surprisingly smooth. So, I would definitely give that pen a shot, and I think you may really like it. And because it has a... Um, um, a uh, um, well, uh, a very good flow, I think it's, it's very suitable. Of course, another thing you can do is buy a Franklin Christoph music nib. 
I've had excellent experiences with those. That's a number six nib. Uh, it's not that cheap, uh, and you only buy a nib. So you have to uh, either have a pen with a number six nib that, that can accommodate it, or you need to buy a separate pen with them. But the Fractal Crystal Music nib is not flexible, unlike the Nippon Set nib, but it does have excellent flow. Really, really nice, and that's also a very good. That's an extremely broad nib, though. I think it's 1.9 millimeters. That's that's very, very broad. So you can try that too. Okay, the next one, Daniel. Daniel also had a, a fairly long story that I have paraphrased here, but Daniel said that he has uh, he is left-handed. He went to a shop. He was recommended to use a private reserve quick drying ink in his Visconti Michelangelo. He said the pen would not write even after I opened the tines. I cleaned it and stored it and when I took it out again the material had flaked off of the metal section near the nib. Uh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, the question is what, what caused this, I suppose. Well, there's a few things I can say about that. I don't know if this was the Michelangelo that has the rose gold. Rose gold plating has been reported to come off, not just in that pen but in other pens too. I have not experienced it myself, but I wonder if that is something that has happened. Another thing that could have happened is it could have been the ink. Private Reserve ink is an ink that has been, many people love it, uh, but that has been reported to melt down the latex sacks in vintage pens. Probably not all private reserve inks, but some private reserve inks have been reported to do that, just like some noodless inks have been reported to do that. Not all noodless inks. Listen to what I'm saying, because whenever I say something like this, I get a barrage of all kinds of crap, basically, uh, from people who are big fans of the brands. Some of these inks, I think from both the noodless brand and the private reserve inks, not all, but some, I consider unsafe. Alright? You know which ones I'm talking about. You know about Bay State Blue. You know it's the case. Alright? It's possible that Private Reserve did that, that it somehow damaged the pen. To be honest, I would be surprised. Would it melt down a latex sack? I can see that happen. But to really destroy the rose gold, or any whatever metal it was, I find that harder to believe. So I don't know. Is it possible that um, the pen was damaged somehow? The Michelangelo has that magnetic cap closure. I wonder if I, I know there is stuff in the pen. There's a sorry in the cap. There's a, a magnet and such. Um, the magnet ring. I'm trying to picture the Michelangelo cap. I'm pretty sure that there is a magnetic ring on the inside and um, that could have hit the tip of the section uh, that's you know where the nib meets the section. Uh, I have experienced that sometimes with capping those types of pens. Same thing goes for the uh, Rembrandt, uh, the Van Gogh, Michelangelo, Salvador Dali, they all have that, that magnetic closure and the magnetic ring is in there. Maybe that has somehow scraped off part of the pen. I find that a more plausible explanation than the ink, but I really don't know. That, that's, that would, my, that's what my guess would be. Uh, those things, those parts, especially the magnetic parts, have also been known to rust uh, so they corrode and they also corrode part of the, uh, the section. It's, uh, that, that design, the pen design, needs some work, I think. Okay, Marios has a question. He asks, can you recommend some nice inks for everyday use and an alternative for Parker Penman Sapphire? We're going to start with that uh, question, the Parker Penman Sapphire. What a minefield. I, I know that people absolutely love that ink and all kinds of brands have tried to emulate uh, that, that specific color. Um, because I just said something that could have been considered unkind towards Private Reserve, one ink that I found very close is Private Reserve DC Super Show Blue. Wonderful color. 
and that is a deep, rich blue with a red sheen, just like Parker Pam and Sapphire. And that is a private reserve ink that I use, all right? So I'm not shunning the brand, I'm not saying you shouldn't buy it. All I'm saying is, some of those inks, maybe all of them, should be treated with care. So what I do is I use that ink, but I don't use it in very expensive pens. I use it in special pens that are not super expensive, and that should anything happen to them, I don't really mind. I also don't need to use it in vintage pens, all right? That I think is a good one. Um, there is also Ackermann Shocking Blue, but Ackermann a little harder uh, to, to obtain, although Ackermann in The Hague does international shipping, so I don't, I don't really understand the, uh, the issue. They even have a, a good website now, which is... I thought it was Ackermann.ink, um, where they do just this. It's even in English, so it's, it's very easy, all right? And of course, there are other people. Vaness Pens, uh, Anderson Pens, they sell Ackermann ink in the US, all right? It's a little harder to get, but you get a nice amount, and Shocking Blue is also an ink that's a bit high maintenance, but it's also a very deep blue uh, with a slightly red sheen. My personal favorite is still DC Super Show Blue. But... Okay, but then the other question was, can you recommend some nice inks for everyday use? Sure! Um, let me see. I like a good royal blue. I know it's a bit boring, but Pelican Royal Blue, you can even get it in liter bottles, so that will really last you a while. Uh, I like Waterman Florida Blue now, now not Mystery Blue, but Serenity Blue, or Serenity. I think that's a very, very good ink, very well behaved and safe. Um, I, I like a couple of other uh, Mont Blanc inks, well, I mean, sorry, I like a couple of other inks by Mont Blanc. Uh, I have had absolutely no issues with any Mont Blanc ink I've ever used. So for me that's a safe ink, an ink that I can use. Um, as I said earlier, Mont Blanc is very pedantic about what they want you to put in their pens. And guess what? They allow you to put their own inks in their pens. So if they trust their own inks with their pens, then by extension I would expect those to be pretty safe. And that's exactly my experience. I've never had any issue. Their uh, regular Royal Blue is a great ink. Um, the Oyster Grey is not for everyone, but Irish Green is fantastic. Toffee Brown is fantastic. I don't much care for the Burgundy Red. I think it's a little too washed out. I would like to see a more powerful red. Um, they have a Mystery Black. It's just a black, but it's a good black. Um, Aurora Black, by the way, is, is an excellent black. Um, so I love, uh, and of course, Lavender Purple by Moonblast, another great ink. So those are not the cheapest inks, but I use them in any pen without hesitation. I've never had any issues, no flow issues, no staining, no destroyed pens, etc. So I can really recommend those. Bouvard asks a very interesting question. How many pens have you broken and were you able to fix them? Uh, I'm just giving this quick thought. I know of one pen that I have actively broken that was unfortunately <laughs> that was a vintage Mont Blanc. Um, I had a Mont Blanc 22 that I purchased and I was not that advanced in my my pen knowledge at the time and I thought that I had a Mont Blanc 220 and that just has a piston that unscrews like a, a say Noodler's nib creeper so you just keep twisting it and then it will just pop out and I thought with the 22 it would work the same way so I was doing that and then I heard and that was the end because the piston rod broke it snapped and that was unfixable uh, so that that required a new piston and Mont Blanc doesn't sell spare parts or it doesn't give out spare parts you have to send it into Mont Blanc uh, it, was, it was a nasty business not not because of Mont Blanc but it's just annoying um, Ask any pen repairman, I think, and they will say that they have broken a few pens in that time. It's just what happens. You, uh, the pens are fragile objects, especially vintage ones. And if you don't know what you're doing, or if you exert the wrong amount of pressure at the wrong time, then you can easily shatter one. It's what happens. Uh, the Mont Blanc incident was worst because it was also Mont Blanc. It's known as you know, a prestigious uh, brand and all that. I, I was uh, that that hurt me a bit. Especially my pride, I must say. Um, fortunately, it wasn't an extremely expensive Mont Blanc, but even so. Apart from that, I don't think I have really ever destroyed pens. I mean, you, you do things, you make mistakes sometimes, especially when you 
reach a point where you may start to grind your own nips, nibs, sorry, um, you learn. You make mistakes, you grind something down to the bone, you, you destroy tipping, you, you do things, you may snap off a tine if you're really excessive. But I think apart from that, I haven't really done anything. So that, that Mont Blanc was wrecked though, could not be saved. Blake asks, can you compare a Pilot Varsity and a Pelican M1000 medium? That's a little bit like comparing Spam to filet mignon. I didn't come up with that saying. Um, not really. I understand what you're saying, that you want to learn about the smoothness of those nibs. First of all, I don't have a Pelican M1000 in medium. But yeah, th those are such radically different pens, it's very hard to compare those two. I mean, you have a, a single-use, non-refillable pen, and then you have a flagship pen from another brand. I, I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, that's very, very difficult. Both are very smooth nibs but in very different ways. The feeling of the pen is different, the, the nibs feel very different, the M1000 nib is springy. Um, I, uh, no, not really. Okay, Legendary Poro asks, do you prefer 23 karat palladium Visconti nibs to 18k Olmas nibs for everyday writing? Now that's an interesting question. Uh, it, it, uh, I don't think it is a secret that I, I do enjoy the Visconti brand. Um, but to be honest, the Palladium nibs, I, I do have some, uh, some issues with. And the reason I have some issues with them is that they, um, they're a bit finicky especially the broader ones. The recent uh, Palladium nibs I have tried, uh, quite a couple of them had issues, uh, especially the broader ones. A lot of baby's bottoms, a lot of over polishing, a lot of skipping, uh, very inconsistent quality control. I have also heard that from uh, at least one retailer who just not, I'm just not going to mention who that is, not to, to be mysterious, but I, I just don't want to involve him in this. Uh, but that person indicated that you know a lot of the the palladium nibs they they get they have to test and a lot of them they have to send back to Visconti to to you know, repolish regrind regrind etc. The problem is that if you get a palladium nib from Visconti that writes well, it will be an absolute dream. And Dream Touch is a fantastic name because they are super smooth, a little springy, especially in the final ones. You really notice that the springiness. They're not flex nibs. They're not semi flex nibs. They're just a little. Bit more springy than your average nib, and they are so smooth, wonderful, delicious, juicy, fantastic nibs. But a lot of them are too finicky. They need to up their quality control. There's too many issues with skipping, with hard starts, etc. So in that regard, I would say yes. I would prefer an Omas 18K nib. I've used a few. I've had zero issues with those. I don't like fine nibs that much, but on my Omas Paragon I have a fine nib. It is one of the greatest nibs I own. Super smooth, nice, well-tuned, works well. It's great. No issues with that. So if you like to work a little bit on your own nibs, I think the Palladium nibs can be a lot of fun, especially the broader ones. But they're also hard to tune because they're so soft, so they spring a bit more easily. Um, for normal everyday use, which is your question, I would say yes. Go with the Olmas nibs. Question from Oscar. Oscar asks, can you recommend me 10 fountain pens costing from 100 to 400 dollars? Um, well, uh, that's the entire question. 10 is rather a lot and I don't know anything about you. So I don't know what, you, what you're looking for, in, we've discussed this extensively in the previous episode of this, but I mean, what are you looking for? Nib material, pen material, pen filling system, how are you going to use it? And again, 10, that's also a lot of pens to recommend. So here's the short answer. 10 pens between $100 and $400, get 10 Lamy 2000s. Okay, final question for today. Armand, Armand asks, 
I have several Parker sonnets with snap caps. Upon opening them, there is ink in the cap that I have to wipe down. Any suggestions? Snap caps are the work of the devil. The problem with some snap caps is that they have a very tight closure mechanism. And the problem with that is that you snap it in place and you get that nice loud snap. And what happens is, I think, I could be wrong, but I think that what happens is you somehow make your nib vibrate just a microscopic amount because of the impact of the snap that turns some of the ink to become some sort of aerosol agent. It becomes airborne, it flies into the cap, and that's what you get. Now that's one explanation. The other explanation is maybe your nib just leaks a bit. Maybe there was a bit of an issue. I've had that with Parker nibs that they leak a bit, but you get ink in the section. In that case, I would recommend a really good cleaning. Make sure that your nib and feet are really clean, so give it a really good flushing, maybe with a, a bulb syringe or something like that, but really make sure that there is no residue ink, no blockage in the feed or something. Okay, now, provided that that is not the problem, uh, I really think that, that that snapping motion is, is what causes the ink to just splatter a bit from the nib. What you can do to reduce that is first of all cap your nib or sorry cap your pen gently don't jam the cap on there what i would do or what i have done in the past to reduce the issue is hold the pen nib upwards right if you do it downwards so if you take the cap and you push the pen in then gravity is assisting ink to fly out that's just the way fountain pen works so put it nib upwards and gently put the cap on you don't you know you don't have to do it in a microscopically precise fashion like this but instead of just snapping it on just snap it on gently maybe put your fingers on the barrel and kind of guide the cap into place it sounds really stupid but the thing with that is that it reduces the impact of the snap as a result I have found less ink in my sections um, something that I think some people do mainly in in um, very dry climates is take a little bit of sponge, wetten it a bit, not not soaking wet, wetten it a bit, and put it on top of the um, all the way, push it into the top of the cap. You have to be a little bit careful with that because you don't want to bend the nib. I understand it's soft, but even so, uh, that is mainly to make sure that the the uh, the nib remains a bit moist. I don't think that will really help here. Uh, a sim, I mean, it, it wouldn't really absorb all the ink. Um, the simplest solution, and that is another very lame solution, is to just carry a small cloth. You know, just have a small cloth with you, which you can use to, when you uncap the pen, to just wipe it down. Uh, I, I always have a cloth with me. If you use fountain pens a lot, find a spot. I, I have a, a writing folio, that, you know, a leather thing that opens up. It has little slots for credit cards in them, and one of them is a folded small glasses cloth that I use a lot. You know, if you spill a bit of ink, you have some nib creep or whatever, you can just quickly wipe it down. It's stupid, but that really works. So I would cap your pen gently, and I would just make sure that you have a cloth with you. And apart from that, yeah, it's it's inherent in the design of the pen. I mean, you unless you have a, a screw-on cap, um, this is what you get. And of course, finally, don't shake your pen around too much. That may sound like a very obvious answer, but be careful because if your pen is in a pouch in a bag and the bag shakes around in a car or a train or whatever uh, or on your back and that could also make more ink splatter so those are those would be my tips and that's it okay guys that was uh, the second episode of consult the doctor I hope this was useful if you have any more questions and I know you do then please leave them as comments in this video you can always also send me an email I try to collect as many interesting questions and I try to focus on questions that are interesting to a broader audience instead of just, uh, um, you know, uh, answering questions like what specific pen should I purchase because that's only interesting to one person, I think. But that's what I'm going to do for the next episode as well. Please leave your questions. I try to answer as many as I can in as useful a fashion as I can. And that's all. Let's do it.
Así era ella. 